want you to locate something that can be used as a bookmark. I tore a piece off of my little insert in my bulletin. That's what I'm using. I guess you don't have inserts. Uh, find something. Tear off a piece of paper. Borrow a card from the back of your pew. And you're going to put that in Ephesians chapter 2. So open a Bible, find Ephesians chapter 2, and then put a bookmark right in it. Because after you do that, we're going to flip over to Hebrews chapter 11. If at some point you locate Ephesians and you're like, what did he just say was the second one? It's in your bulletin, Hebrews 11, Ephesians chapter 2. While you're finding your way, we're just going to review. A few weeks ago, a couple months ago, we looked at a couple of truths. The fundamental truth in the universe is that God is God, you are not, I am not. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, meaning here is creation, and then here's the God of creation who is fundamentally different and separate and in a class of his own and bigger than the creation. And then we learn the most surprising truth in the universe, that God is not angry with you. That God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them. But if God is God and we need to bow down before him, and he's not angry with us, those are kind of two truths that are in tension. We're not universalists here that say that every road leads to heaven. So how is it that if God is not angry with us, there can still be the possibility of spending eternity separated from him? We learned from John chapter 3, Jesus told Nicodemus, a very religious man, very faithful, even pastor, look, you need to be born again. You need to be reconciled to God. This is not optional. So the question comes, all right, we understand these truths. God is God. God is not angry with me. I must be born again. But how? What do you want me to do about it? Even if I understand these truths, how do I come to live in light of these truths? By the way, this truth right here, we call it the gospel, the good news, because it is good news. God is not angry with us. So, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek or the Gentile. Most of us in this room are very grateful that this is extended to the Gentiles as well. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. There he's quoting the prophet Habakkuk, and that verse is quoted all over the New Testament. It's very important, and we'll see why in a second. But faith, belief, we understand this is our part in whatever this story of salvation is. But what is faith? Because there might be a couple different understandings. I would say personally, just from my experiences and being involved in Christian ministries courses and churches, maybe a modern evangelical understanding of the word faith or believe would be being convinced that something is true. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for my sins. That is true. And belief certainly does involve being convinced that something is true. But that is an incomplete picture of what faith is. Not to shoot it down, though. Like, this is not a modern understanding, actually. There are very, very, very old creeds that we still recite to this day. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. So, yes, part of faith is just knowing in your knower that something is true. Did you know that the Bible was not written in English? Did you know that English didn't exist as a language for hundreds of years after the Bible was written? So when we read the Bible in English, what we're reading is translations of either Hebrew or Greek or a little bit of Aramaic. And in the New Testament, when you read the word faith, you're reading the Greek word pistis. 
Or if you're reading the word believe, you're reading the verb form of that, pistuo. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. But pistis also can be translated faithfulness. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. When you look at that word in Galatians 5, and then you compare it to most of the other words where it's faith, like in Romans 10, 17, they are exactly the same. Exactly the same word for faith and for faithfulness. In the Hebrew, we might see the word aman. Then Abraham believed in the Lord, and God reckoned it to him as righteousness. Aman also means faithfulness, though. Nehemiah says, I had a task that needed to be done. I selected these guys over here because they were reliable. They were faithful. Same word. Emunah, the righteous will live by his faith. Quoted all over the New Testament. And this word means faith. But guess what? It also means faithfulness. So here's the question. In our own English understanding, are faith and faithfulness the same thing? No, not really. <laughs> faith at the very least, is having an understanding of something. And faithfulness is being dependable. Those aren't the same thing. I guess we could say, well, if I really believe something, then I'm going to be true to it. If I have faith, then I'll be faithful. We could try to do that, but God is faithful. Who does God believe in? Well, how about this? Are speaking and listening the same thing? I'm not married, but I've seen enough marriages to know, no, that is not the same thing. <laughs> Speaking and listening are not the same thing, kind of like faith and faithfulness aren't the same thing, but you could use a word like conversation to describe an activity that involves both speaking and listening. That is what faith is in a biblical sense. Pistis, aman, emunah involves both faith and faithfulness. Faith is not an individual sport. If all faith was, was being convinced of something, then I could sit in my living room and read or watch YouTube videos about physics and decide in my head, I believe that the universe is 14 billion years old. That would be an individual thing. But faith, just like a conversation, is not an individual sport. Could you imagine what would be going on if you had a conversation just by yourself? That might kind of suggest something's not quite right up here, right? They might put you away. Faith is not something you do by yourself. There are two people involved in biblical faith. There's one person who is trusting, and there's one person who is trustworthy. That's really important for us to get a handle on. And God, surprise, surprise, he's the faithful one. God is always faithful. So let's look at Hebrews 11 first. Starting with verse 1. Read very carefully along with me. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Go ahead and raise your hand right now if what you have in your Bible isn't necessarily exactly what I just read. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Does anybody have a different translation there? If you're reading your pew Bible, I think it's the NIV. It doesn't say that. So we might need to get to the bottom of this. Check this out. The New English translation, not particularly literal, says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for, being convinced of what we do not see. The NIV says faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. But as we start to get towards more literal translations of the Greek, we have faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Or the New American Standard, what I read to you. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Look at all those underlined words. That's the Greek word hypostasis. In each of those English translations, 
Are those underlying words the same thing? Look at that third one. <laughs> the substance? Faith is the substance of things hoped for? And look at the word surrounded by asterisks there, by stars. Is being convinced the same thing as evidence? This is confusing. This bothers me. I remember about 10 years ago as I started looking at translations because I wanted to know more about faith. And this is like the key verse in some ways in the Bible. It's supposed to be a definition. But those translations don't mean the same thing. So that was bothering me. Do you guys remember Fred Ness? Yeah. Some of you are probably still in contact with Fred. Fred knows his Greek. I don't. And so I said, Fred, can we get together and can we figure out what's going on here? There are four key words in this verse. Faith is the hypostasis of elpizo, the elechos of things blepo. Like I said, I'm not particularly well-versed in Greek, but Fred is. So we laid it out, and this is what we came up with. This is the Neth Reese translation. <laughs> Currently in our translation project, the NRT has one verse <laughs> that has been translated. Faith is the present reality. It's really real. Hypostasis means something that is really real. It's not abstract. It's not imaginary. It actually exists, okay? That's what hypostasis is, and elechos means basically the same thing. So faith is the present reality, it's really real, of a future certainty. Elpizo isn't just I hope, as in I hope the Blazers win the next time they play. Almost like a wish, okay? When we say I hope, that's usually what we mean, is it's not certain that this is going to work out. In the Bible, in Greek, elpizo is a future certainty. If you read in the Bible that we put our hope in something, we're putting our hope in something that is assured. It will happen if it's in the future. Jesus is coming again. He will redeem all things. And so our hope is in a future certainty. Faith is the present reality of a future certainty. It's the present reality of things that are invisible. So if I were to try to unpack this I'd say faith involves the actual, real invasion of the eternal creator into the here and now. And God has at his disposal all of creation, including a future timeline that we have no access to ourselves, but he's timeless, and there's a spiritual domain that we cannot see. It's invisible to us. And when God, the eternal creator, presents himself to us in the here and now, all of this is coming along with him. And we'll see this play out here in this passage. Let's read it again. <laughs> Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith... Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up, for he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. In these first two stories, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't really get it. <laughs> I don't really understand the story of Cain and Abel. I recognize there was blood shed by Abel and it was just fruits and vegetables by Cain, but why, how they were supposed to, I don't know. I'm just being honest with you. And the story of Enoch. We know that he walked with God. We know that he was pleasing to God and God took him up and he, he didn't die a human death. But I don't really get those two, so we're just gonna say they were living by faith and when we understand what faith is, we can apply that to these stories. But let's keep going. Verse 6, and without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. There are two truths about God that we've had drilled into our head now. God is God. When he presented himself to Moses and Moses said, okay, you're going to send me, who should I say, what's the name of the God who is sending me? God said, tell them, I am has sent you. And this is what we're referencing here. 
Those who come to God must first believe that he is, not just that he exists, but he is God, and that he is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. God is great, and God is good. That's what we need to understand in faith. Look at verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs in the same promise. For he was looking to the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive, even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised In these first few stories after Abel and after Enoch, we see this pattern of God presenting himself to a human being. He comes and he speaks to Noah, and then he speaks to Abraham, and even Sarah overhears the promise of God. And when God speaks and presents himself to these people and they somehow experience him, they decide he's faithful. I mean, look at him. He's God. I can trust him. And so you have this two-party transaction. You have the one who is trusting, but it's really about the one who is trustworthy. You have the one who is putting their faith in God, but he, God, is the one who is faithful. It's really about him. So let's look at our own story. We're going to flip back over to Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 1. And you and I, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Remember, spiritual death is separation from God. Spiritual life is being connected to God. We were separated and dead in our trespasses and sins, in which we formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, And we're by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. This is called the bad news. We're spiritually dead, and our spiritual death is very obvious in the way that we're living. Very obvious. Love the next word, though. But, in spite of all of that, God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Grace, charis in Greek, is just unearned kindness. God is kind to us even though we do not deserve it. We're spiritually dead. We're rebellious. We want to make ourselves God. And yet, in spite of that, he shows us kindness because He shows us kindness just because, because he wanted to. By grace, unearned kindness, you have been saved. And God raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith that not... Of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Faith is basically the opposite of works. When it comes to saving faith, we have a situation that is beyond anything we can do about it. We're spiritually dead. We are separated from God, and even though he has forgiven our trespasses, we still refuse to come back to the loving Father that is waiting for us. There's a heart condition that we cannot fix. Our hearts, the core of who we are, are just simply inaccessible to us. But God is a big God, and he can do anything, and he can 
fix our hearts. He can give us new hearts. He can put his Holy Spirit inside of us. And that's what we call being born again. That's what we call salvation. And this salvation does not come from anything that we do. There are billions of people on this planet that serve all sorts of different religions. And all of these religions have the same thing in common. There's a list of things to do. If I do these things, then I can earn God's favor. I can achieve nirvana. I can elevate myself to higher and higher levels of heaven. I can seal my guaranteed future if I do these things. And the Bible could not be more clear. No, you cannot. It is by grace, by God's unearned kindness that you have been saved through faith. So what is faith? Well, if faith is a work, if faith is an individual sport, if it's just me deciding what is true, don't I get the credit? If I just convince myself and say, I'm going to believe no matter what that this is true, that's me doing it, and I get the credit. Faith is not a work. Faith is a white flag. This, this is the best concept I can come up with to really demonstrate what we're talking about here. There is a God who is faithful and capable and good. And if I want to be right with him, I need to wave my white flag. I need to give up my right to save myself. I need to relinquish the responsibility of my salvation. I need to say, I cannot do this. I can't. You know, sometimes we sing songs about surrender and find ourselves just basking and, oh, I surrender. And we got this smile on our face. You ever seen an army that needs to surrender and wave a white flag and they're just walking towards the enemy? Just, <laughs> I surrender all to you, right? Faith as a white flag is when we recognize we come to the end of ourselves. I was a Pharisee, which means I was trying to keep those rules. I was really faithful in keeping those rules, but I was a self-righteous jerk. There was not a lot of love in my heart for the people around me. I checked all those boxes next to the things that I could do, but God in his grace more and more brought me to an understanding. My heart still has a problem. I still need to be born again. And... I couldn't do it. And I said that, God, I can't do this. And I started pleading with God, hey, creator of the universe who is good, my heart needs to change. I cannot even access this heart. Will you save me? And then he did. He changed my heart. It made all the difference in the world. What did I contribute to this? Nothing. My contribution was faith and that faith was explicitly saying, I have nothing to contribute. The attitude at the heart of biblical faith, you could probably guess what it is just by looking at the background, right? God is God and I am not. This isn't just for salvation. It would be a pretty silly religion if we said salvation is by faith. Grace alone through faith alone. But after salvation, whatever it is, go ahead and just start doing works again. Everything else is up to you. It was by grace you were saved through faith, but now we've got this dual system here where it's all works. And we see this all over the Bible. God really wants us to understand. He's God, we are not. He is faithful, we need to turn it over to him. So for example, okay, these are theological synonyms. These words don't literally mean the same thing as faith. Okay, so when you're reading your Old Testament and you read the word wait, it's a different word than the word for faith. But theologically, the concept of it is the same from cover to cover. From Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, the message is extremely consistent. Those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. We're waiting for the faithful one instead of taking it upon ourselves. Be still. A lot of these passages that we're looking at, the world is not the way that it should be. 
Either individually my life is not what it should be, something needs to change, or the world around me is not the way it should be, something needs to change. The reality in our town, the seasons we're going through as a church, something needs to happen. In the midst of that sort of scenario in Psalm 46, it says, be still. It literally says, cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. He's exalted. He gets the credit because he's the one that actually does it. It's not that we do something in our own ability and then say, oh yeah, all the glory to God. That's just lip service. We actually cease striving. We're still, we allow him to get glory for himself. Rest, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. We who have believed enter that rest, just as he has said. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Now there's a part of us that's starting to resist this a little bit. Isn't faith without works dead? Isn't that what James says? We've seen a ton in 1 John that obedience is required. If we continue on sinning, things are not okay. Surely we must do something. There are commands, even in the New Testament, even outside of the law with all of its regulations. You get to the New Testament, and Jesus says, do this. And Paul says, do this. And John and Peter and James. There are things that we're supposed to do. I don't think any of us can dispute that. But even if we recognize the what of what we're supposed to do, there's still a question. How? If I read in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus says, don't worry, I still have two choices even in the midst of that command. I can say, all right, Jesus said don't worry, so I'm going to stop worrying. Or I can say, Jesus says not to worry, that's impossible. Nothing's impossible with God. Father, would you take care of my worry? We might see that Jesus says to forgive one another from the heart. We could say, all right, I do forgive this person. I do forgive this person. I do forgive this person that did this thing to me. I can't believe they did that to me. (laughs) Is that forgiveness? We cannot forgive. These are commands that are impossible. We're going to worry. We're going to hold on to things if we're doing it ourselves. So even outside of salvation, it is still a faith thing that allows us to do these commands. Abide is a word in the New Testament. We were introduced to it briefly last Sunday. I think we're probably going to see some more about it next week. The word literally means stay. So if some Greek guy needed to teach like the most important command to his dog, that command would be abide, stay. Don't leave. This makes sense in the context of John 15. Stay in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it stays in the vine, so neither can you unless you stay in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who stays in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. The command here is not anything like super heavy. It's just don't leave. Walk by the Spirit. Are you so foolish? Having begun with this salvation here, having begun by the Spirit, being born again by grace through faith, are you now being perfected by the flesh or by works? But I say to you, walk by the Spirit. Turn it over to the Spirit. Wave the white flag. Say, I can't do these things. Walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Last week, Don had a nugget that was very pertinent to today. I mean, we were talking about the second coming of Christ But he pointed out, if as we're trying to understand a concept like the second coming, the day of the Lord, if we come to an understanding about that, and we kind of are like, yeah, I'm all that. I get it. And it puffs us up. There's something wrong with the picture. But if in our understanding, if our reading of the day of the Lord humbles us and puts us in our place, we know that we've landed. That's true about everything, and that includes our understanding of faith. 
If my understanding of faith is that I did something for God, I made a decision, I committed my life, and that is my faith, let's be real. I might give lip service to the idea that God gets all the glory, but it's about what I did, and it puffs me up. Jesus said on that day, that day, many will say to me, Lord, didn't we minister? Didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we perform miracles? Didn't we prophesy in your name? And yet Jesus says to them, depart from me. I never knew you. It's not about us. Faith is not what I do. And if my faith puffs me up, then my faith is a work. Faith is a white flag. It is the opposite of a work. It's saying, I can't do this, but you can. That's humbling. That puts us in our place. Let's take a minute or two to just listen to what the Spirit might be saying to us. Reflect on these things.